Hello, virtual doll convention. We are going to have our program with the wonderful Jonathan Green, who is such a fabulous person, knows so much about dolls and especially collectibles. And so we are gonna bring him on and chat Raggedy Ann and learn all about his Raggedy Ann. So I am adding him right now. And he is going to be joining us in just a second. So I am so, so, so excited for this presentation. And I know a lot of you are. I have a couple of my dolls that I wanted to show John as well. And um, hopefully that, hopefully John gets on here in a second. And we're gonna just be chatting Raggedy Ann. So Jonathan Green, let's get you on here. Do, do, do. All right, here he is. So here is Jonathan. It worked. Hello, Jonathan. Hey, it worked. Got on. It worked. Yeah. We've been working hard to figure out how to work this whole process, and you've been amazing. Well, thank you. So Thank you. So we are here uh, in Raggedy Ann Central, which is my house and your house. Yes. Can you tell our viewers real quick, John, why don't we turn you around so we don't have that light behind you? Yeah, uh, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Uh, there you go. No, just turn. There you go. Just turn. You're good. There we go. Yeah, there, there we you go. go. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So it's lovely New Hampshire with snow, so I'm afraid we have a little uh, lighting issues. Well, everyone has just been so flexible and understanding, and they are so excited for mm -hmm. this chat. So we're going to take what we can get. Exactly. So we are here, and um, Jonathan, you have loved Raggedy Ann for your entire life. Can you tell us a little bit of the backstory on that? My, my love of Raggedy Ann and Andy? Yes. Um, yes. Allegedly, of course, family history, but allegedly, one of the very first times I went out of the house as an infant, my mother went to a children's clothing store and I grabbed a hold of a Raggedy Andy and would not let go and screamed bloody murder if they tried to take it out of my hands. And so that was sort of how the whole thing started. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I really loved Raggedy Ann. I'll just tell you real quick mm -hmm. for me because and I'm going to turn around and show a couple of my mom's dolls. Uh, I grew up in a doll shop, and a lot of the dolls I could not really play with because they were so breakable, and Raggedy Ann was not. So I was just able to, I fell in love with her mm -hmm. because I could drop her, play with her, hug her, do anything really, and she was going to be okay. I know you've seen a couple of my dolls. Mm -hmm. These are just a few. These are ones that I actually made. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know you crocheted. These my mom. Yeah, and these were all made um, before I turned 12. So th this first one I made when I was probably like six years old. Very nice. Isn't that fun? Mm -hmm. That's adorable. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, actually, this is number one. This is the sock Raggedy Ann. <laughs> and, then I, and then I went from there. But we all start somewhere with Raggedy Ann, right? Yeah, I love the green hair. But I do hair. have a lifelong love. So it is wonderful to chat with you. Now, Jonathan, you have a fabulous collection and you also have some dolls that are uh, for sale as well. So if any of our conventioneers are watching this and would like to reach out to you uh, to maybe purchase a Raggedy Ann, is that sure. okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm gonna Absolutely. do a switch though so people are looking at the dolls, not at me. Because um, the dolls are much more interesting. Uh, so, I mean, these, let's see if I can get this here. These three are the earliest commercially made dolls, which were made by the Unbreakable Toy Company in Michigan. Um, most people don't know that there was toy making in Michigan. And um, these were made because the Gruel family could not keep up with the demand for the dolls. So as early as November, 1918, the first year that they came out, these dolls were on the market. So they're pretty much about the same time as the cottage industry dolls. Mm -hmm. so. Now, do they still, do, do, do those dolls exist, the cottage dolls that have the painted on feet? Yes. Uh, why some have painted on feet and some don't is unknown. Um, 
one of the things about the early dolls, the early marketing is, I think my personal belief is that the intention was for every doll to be somewhat different. They were supposed okay. to be a doll that was found in the attic. And so they intentionally did not want every doll to look the same. Um, and that may have been the reason why they have different faces. They have different feet. Um, they're all the early dolls are just a little funky. And aren't they just wonderful? Are the earliest ones your favorites, personally? Um, I think the earliest commercial dolls are my favorites. I have a hard time actually warming up to some of the cottage dolls. They're just a little funky and not sort of part of that is within the first couple of months that Raggedy Ann was out, Raggedy Ann also became a slang term for something that was poorly made. And I think that has to do with that early cottage industry production. Mm -hmm. so. It's important to note when we're looking at these dolls that the hair is um, dark brown, not right. red, which is what a lot of people think of when they think of Raggedy Ann. Well, they, the dolls originally were not, um, Raggedy Ann and Andy were not interchangeable. And in fact, the earliest dolls were not even made at the same factory. So Raggedy Ann, and so here's our, our broad shot of the Raggedy Ann's here. Wonderful. And then if you go up here and we look, love them. the Raggedy Andy is the one with the red hair. And also the faces are very different. Um, it's not the same doll with different clothing. That really didn't happen until the early 1930s. So, and then, you know, I talked earlier about how, um, the dolls all look different and Raggedy Ann sort of became synonymous for something poorly made. These dolls started in 1920 and their intent was to have a doll that looked more like the illustrations in the book. Um, and that's actually in the contract that uh, the new dolls were to look more like the illustrations in the book. That doll right there with oh. the with the uh, blue outfit that looks like the dress that is on the cover of the book, is it? No, that's um, that's a very different print that has sort of multicolor splotches on it. Um, the earliest dolls really don't have a floral dress. They have a let's see if I can get a good well. They have like a paisley. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, it's like a okay. uh, like a Jacobean paisley print. Um, which the idea was to get something that looked old fashioned in the 1920s. Um, so that would have been their idea of something from the 1880s. So those are- They're just so much fun. They are- we, the, These early Raggedy Ann's are great. I just now, love how the can smiles. We, uh, what are some of the, uh, yes, that's, that's the next question I was gonna ask is the smiles. And I wanted to touch on the, uh, the amount of eyelashes, the different eyelashes on the early dolls. Well, there it, Johnny Gruel was a very inconsistent artist, and that's one of the problems with the dolls. And so the dolls did tend to fit, uh, match what he was drawing in the latest book. And actually, my single lash doll isn't here, but there's a, a Volan doll that has one eyelash, and that is consistent with what he was drawing at the time. Um, and so the different faces that sort of materialize and up here, these are the very last ones, um, tend to be somewhat consistent with his drawing style. And then mm -hmm. of course, backing up here, this is the last set um, but it shows the whole family with beloved Belindy, Raggedy Ann, Raggedy Andy, Percy the policeman, and then Eddie Elf in the corner. Um, and that Eddie Elf. Eddie is Elf is wonderful. That is actually from Shirley Temple's doll collection. That that wonderful. Yep, oh, how that, great. That, this kid, this kid belongs to Shirley so Temple. So rare. So and it That's is actually exceedingly it's, rare. The it's interesting mm -hmm. that he would have been preserved in such good condition because this doll is from like 1931, 32, which is really before she became a child star. So it was actually one of her dolls as opposed to a fan gift. 
oh, how interesting. Mm. Don't you love that um, early picture of Shirley Temple with the Voland Raggedy Ann? She's uh, at a tea party, kind of right. um, serving that's, her some tea. It's a cute picture. That's this doll. Um, I mean, it's not that doll, but this is the uh, same style, which is, uh, again, interesting for a very short period of time. Volen tried to make the dolls themselves. It was not a success, and so the dolls are very hard to find. But um, these dolls were actually made um, by in the P.F. Volen factory. How interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a lot of uh, myth and folk and uh, lore, legend of lore, about the candy hearts. Oh, okay. What is your official stance on the candy hearts of um, the backstory, what, can you uh, tell our conventioners um, about the candy hearts? Well, first of all, the candy heart is recycled from another Johnny Gruel story. He had a much earlier story about a gingerbread man who was loving and altruistic and kept giving away body parts because he had been baked with a candy heart. Um, and that got recycled into the Raggedy Ann story. There are early cottage dolls that do have real candy hearts in there. Um, okay. So they were made, and sometimes you'll find a doll with this really ugly brown stain on her chest where the child probably, you know, <laughs> kept sucking at it or whatever, but it's uh, right. melted away, but it was there. Um, but when, It was there. Yeah. Okay. But when you start getting into the early dolls, none of the commercial dolls had candy hearts. They all had the cardboard ones. Okay. Well, I am so glad because I always believed that those early, the very mm -hmm. cottage ones had the candy heart, mm -hmm. but some people say it didn't. So now I am so glad that, um, that it's true. Oh yeah. It's true. Yay. Yes. Yay. So now uh, we've been talking about my dolls. Why don't you uh, turn around and show some of yours? Okay. Well, we have one of the ones that is, I guess the crowning glory of our collection mm -hmm. right here is this wonderful oversized raggedy Andy. And there's a picture of Johnny Gruel that I just love and an original receipt. Here, let me fix this shirt a little bit. That shows where he had ordered um, like 16 of them from P.F. Voland. Mm -hmm. And he's huge. Oh, yeah. And he's got these wonderful, wonderful, huge paws. These big baseball mitt hands. Uh, what can you tell me about him? Well, I'm actually start with a little bit about Raggedy Andy. Um, Raggy, uh, the contract for Raggedy Ann was not in Johnny Gruel's favor. So when they wrote the contract for Raggedy Andy, he insisted on having the rights to oversee doll production. And that's one of the reasons why Raggedy Andy and Raggedy Ann were made at different factories. And since he had the right to doll production, he came up with these oversized dolls to promote the book. And so actually the earliest of these oversight dolls were Andes and not Anne's. So that's, you know, sort of interesting. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that is so interesting. I would love to find an Anne, but I have never found one. Do you have one? I don't have one. I try to, I, I lived for years in a New York studio apartment. So I have this thing about large dolls. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, um, I mean, I do love them. I think they're wonderful. They really are. It's like um, he, he's just such a treasure in the room, and he just brightens up the room. He's, he's a lot of fun. Well, we have um, – mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Oh, and here's oh. – Oh, so we, uh, you've seen a couple of mine. This sweet boy, he was um, in a fire, well, the, and I rescued him. There should be an Anne and a uh, Belindy that went with him. The, yes, the Belindy is here, which I bought the set actually she, for the Belindy because she's in great condition considering. Yes, as the saying goes, she cleaned up nicely. She did mm -hmm. beautifully, actually. And then the Anne actually did pretty well, as, pretty well too. Oh, yes. Uh, the three of them came, came in a set. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But the, the, the Volan Belindies, those are just wonderful. I see that you have one as well yes um i have she's she's up there um and you know these were done to um advertise the beloved blending book 
And, you know, according to paper, there is a 36 inch beloved Belindi, but I've never seen one. Um, I've never seen one either. No. That would be a bucket list doll for the both of us. Yes, exactly. It would be wonderful. I do see a lot of homemade and um, I don't want to say like reproduction, but, uh, but homemade, uh, bo bo like Bolin looking beloved Belindis. But what are some of the characteristics that are on the real ones? Um, factory. Well, I mean, you can sort of see there the way the face is painted. Um, mm -hmm. And she has, uh, let's see if I can do it on mine. But, you know, she has a very distinctive fat body. Um, let's see if we can get her. Yes, here. Um, she does. And um, you know, here being kind of indecent with our dolls here, but um, there we go. You can see now. Um, oops, too far. Nice shot of my feet. Um, hey, we... <laughs> but um, yeah, they do have like kind of a, um, a football shaped body yes. almost in a way. Um, and then the actually the dress fabric on Belindis, um, you know, the early ones tend to be a white print with yellow flowers. Um, whether the later ones tend to be a yellow print. Uh, and then there's this um, collar with that sort of very distinctive sawtooth edge lace. Mm -hmm. Which I do not have on mine. Yeah. But I do have the, the trim. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I wanted to touch on that I absolutely love about um, Raggedy Ann and kind of dolls in general, especially from the wartime, was factory shortages. Oh. And when they had, can you tell us a little bit about factory shortages and how that affected the dolls? And we're over here. Um, <laughs> here is a good example of. We're jumping ahead. Yeah, but here's a good example of a factory shortage stall. He's got the black gingham shirt, uh, blue striped trousers. Um, and this was made up of whatever fabrics they could get at the time. Uh, you'll find dolls with um, polka dot legs. Um, I have mm -hmm. an awake asleep here. Oh, it's not here, but I have an awake asleep Anne that has just solid blue legs. Um, these are all the wartime dolls with the orange cotton hair because wool was being used for uniforms. Um, and there's no black outline around the nose. And they're stuffed with cotton because, of course, K-Pak would have been used for life preservers. That is so, it is just so interesting. And, mm -hmm. and I keep finding different dolls. Um, my favorite really, some of them really are the factory shortage ones mm -hmm. because it's just like, they, they feel like survivors to me. Yes. And they, they also. Made they made it. Yeah. Whatever they had. They used what they had and it sort of gives them a little interest. Uh, makes them a little different. I mean, well, here's another one that's not um, so much factory shortages, but this is the very early beloved Belindi. And, you know, they couldn't find a dark brown fabric. So there's this sort of greenish khaki color um, on her. And she doesn't have a nice red. It's that sort of very dusty pink color. Mm -hmm. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know. And we are talking about Georgine. Yes. For those who, um, we, we just fast forwarded from the Volan company and, and um, now to Georgine. Yes, we're doing a bit um, of a ramble. But there, yeah, we love them all. Yes. Uh, there was a, she's wonderful. There was a company right after Voland and before Georgine called Exposition Doll Company. Yes. And um, there aren't very many of those dolls around. Can you tell our viewers what happened there? Uh, well, I um, have to go over to the other participant in this story, which is Molly Goldman. And these are the Molly Goldman dolls here. And towards the end of Voland, they had a um, Volan went out of business in 32 and towards the end they had real financial problems so even though there was a demand for Raggedy Ann and Andy they couldn't produce them uh, so Molly Goldman just started making Raggedy Ann and Andy's because she knew that stores wanted them and Voland wasn't supplying them 
when Voland went out of business, she started producing the dolls um, in a major way. At the same time, Johnny Gorell tried to have the dolls made by the exposition um, doll company. And Molly Goldman, who to be blunt, was not a very nice person, um, right. basically very litigious, litigious and just kept doing lawyer on lawyer on lawyer to put exposition out of business. Um, and mm -hmm. so the exposition dolls are very hard to find. They're very hard to find. That whole fiasco mm -hmm. caused Johnny Grill a lot of stress. Uh, it probably killed him. I mean, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I mean, um, and the... But at the end, he did win the lawsuit. So it's important to, to note that he did win the lawsuit against Molly. And even though he died of a heart attack, he, he died at least knowing that, that he won. He won the lawsuit, but the Grell family never got a penny. Um, because Molly Goldman filed for bankruptcy right after that and got out of having to pay any damages to the Gruel family. So the Gruel family did go on to produce um, wildly successful lines of Raggedy Ann uh, prior um, after Johnny Gruel's passing. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he left the company to his sons and, and Myrtle Gruel. Mm -hmm. And I think they did a pretty good job. Well, there's a whole story there. But before we go, I mean, I do have to, I mean, even though Molly Goldman was a horrible person, um, we have to give her credit for actually creating Raggedy Ann as we know her today. Because she was the one who made the dolls interchangeable with just the clothing making the distinction. Um, she did the that sort of one piece jumpsuit for Raggedy Andy was her design. Um, the printed heart was her design. In fact, the exposition doll does not have a heart in any way, shape, or form, um, which is very odd to me. But um, so, you know, as grudging as it is, you have to give um, Molly Goldman some credit for that. Um, and to go on to what you were saying before, the post Gruel was just about as um, much conflict as the Molly Goldman because uh, basically the two boys couldn't work together and um, Myrtle Gruel actually had to dissolve the company, kick both of her sons to the curb and reform the company with someone else in order to get things moving forward. Um, so that was that's a little family dirt from the early 40s. A little bit of dirt. You know, um, I agree with you on all your sentiments about Molly Goldman completely, but the dolls themselves are actually quite wonderful. Well, I mean, I have to say, I, you notice that I have, you know, several of some of these dolls and very few Mollies. Um, I've never liked the dolls. And when I was a child, we were talking about my love of Raggedy Ann and Andy. Well, at the same time, Shirley Temple's doll collection was at the Museum of Science and Industry in LA, and I had to go. And I loved her early volant. Um, you know, mm -hmm. even at five or six, I love this doll. She had a Molly's Raggedy Andy, and I could not stand it. So even as a young age, I was very opinionated about what is and is not a true raggedy. But. Oh, John, mm -hmm. I agree with you. And um, I have never purchased one for my collection. Mm -hmm. My collection really does lie mm -hmm. with the Voland Raggedy Ann's mm -hmm. and a couple Georgines. And then that's about where it is. But, mm -hmm. but you are um, a historian. Right. So it's important for the story to have those dolls mm -hmm. as a representation. And yet, while we're talking about this, I just don't, for everyone else, I don't want to skip you know, after Molly, these were the dolls that came afterwards, the black outline Georgines. And, Love them. you know, whether these were the last ones just actually designed by Johnny Gruel or certainly the last ones that were really based on his artwork. And I think they're kind of wonderful. Um, and they really do have a sense of Johnny Gruel's Raggedy Ann and mm -hmm. Andy, as opposed to something mm -hmm. else. So, I mean, I don't want to pass over those without giving them some mention. 
Oh no, let's take a look. So what we're looking at now, everybody, uh, are Georgine Raggedy Ann's, which Georgine, they came out with so many wonderful sizes and mm -hmm. faces and mm -hmm. they did the Awake Asleep and yeah, um, so many, so many dolls. Wonderful. Yeah. There's, there's Awake, the there's Sleep. sleep. They made... Yeah. Yes. So, and you know, the other thing about these dolls is because it's before the wartime shortages, I, I find that some of the fabrics on these dolls are also kind of wonderful. They're that sort of, you know, mm -hmm. 30s florals. Um, so they're, they're pretty neat. Um, so they're yeah. wonderful. And, and you can, you can actually purchase, um, you can find them like mint in their box yes sometimes because they are something Some that early folks. doll collectors would have bought those to go you know come out once a year to go under the christmas tree or something like that right so so and then these they just have lovely faces mm -hmm. the earliest ones do have the black outline nose which is which will help for collectors to identify mm -hmm. the time period for for their dolls right and it should be noted that also the McCall pattern, the 820 pattern that came out, that is an exact copy of the commercial pattern used to make these dolls. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting that they didn't alter it for home sewing, but um, that is the exact same pattern. That's very interesting. When Raggedy Ann came out, she really did, when she um, got her fame, she really did kind of take over the nation not yeah. only were millions of dolls made but tell us about some of the other products that were manufactured well actually interesting enough before 1940 there weren't too many products made um and that probably was because of a licensing dispute between voland and johnny gruel voland only made the or licensed the things that they could make so there's uh, jigsaw puzzles valentines and that was really about it you know you would think the whole QP craze people knew about licensing why isn't there fabric why isn't there children's clothing but really none of that happened until 1940 and then when that happened and they did the max fleischer cartoon there was just a a whole flood of merchandise that came out i mean if you could put Raggedy Ann on it, they did. So it's everything, mm -hmm. things you can find today, like fabrics in China and everything. And everything. But also weird things that you can't find today, like um, inflatables for the swimming pool and inflatable rafts. And I mean, there's all these sort of wonderful things when you're reading the licensing contracts that you're kind of going, oh, I wish I could get one of those. <laughs> but you know, it'd be rotted by now. So, right, you know. and they have um, there. There, I don't. I'm not sure if it's still open, but there used to be a Raggedy Ann museum. There was Raggedy Ann festivals, all kinds of things. Um, she's still very popular. John, would you mind backing up so we can see the whole every all of your shelves? I'd love to just see them. Okay. I'm afraid once. this is a little booby trapped it, because. That's okay. Um, it's booby trapped. Look at this, everybody. Look how wonderful. So at the top, you have your Georgines. Yep, those are the early Georgines. And George then in the middle. Then the okay. wartime. And then these are all the later Georgines, um, starting with the Silsbys. And I do want to point out one here, which is not a mistake. Well, take that. But the one that's a blonde was a blonde. There was a period in the 1940s, they did Raggedy Ann comic books. And in the comic book, Raggedy Ann has the sort of orangey rust hair and Raggedy Andy is a blonde. And for a very short period of time, they actually made them to coordinate with the comic books. So if you see a doll oh, like that, it's not a mistake. It's not faded. It actually had blonde hair. See, I didn't even, I didn't know that. I would have thought it was a factory shortage mm -hmm. or something. How interesting. Yes. Look at that. Yeah. So, so these are some of the later Love it. ones. So, and then this yeah. is the, um, you know, this is, I've never understood this face, but this was the face they developed in the late sixties, right before they went out of business, not out of business, but stopped doing, lost the license. And, uh, the face has become rather hard um, compared to some of the earlier dolls. Mm -hmm. 
but you can uh, really, uh, it, it, once you start oh. studying, you can really just kind of identify them real quick based off of the facial characteristics. Yeah, well, let's see if I can do your, and that's beautiful. This side. Now, keep in the mind, and these are just wonderful. These are not all of my dolls. These are just a few that I pulled out so we could have this talk, because um, otherwise, you know, I'd have to rent a ballroom. But um, oh my gosh, yeah. I love it! And Jonathan, which uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but are are some of these are your Volans for sale? Because I know that you. Uh, mentioned that you were um, uh, going to be selling some of them coming up in the future. So I'd like to give our conventioneers first crack at yeah, it. Yeah, because some of the volans are for sale because I like, you know, um, from my point, I don't need to have two. Um, and same thing here. These two are basically duplicates, so I don't need to have both. Um, some of the Andes I feel the same way about. Um, I also, I don't have them here because they take up so much space, but I have several Georgines in boxes that, um, again, they just take up so much space. And I do want to make sure that they survive in pristine condition. So I sort of feel right. it's now time to let someone else be the uh, caretaker of those. So. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe you can get all the ones that are for sale and we can do another video together. We'll have a little um, sure. shopping video. That would be a lot of fun. Yes. Sounds good. What do you, what for you, what do you think about, um, wh what's Raggedy Ann's legacy to the world? What What's her, why do we all love her so very much still to this day? Well, yeah, no, I think the thing about it is, is that it depends on the time period um, mm -hmm. Because in the 1920s, uh, or 1918 into the 20s, World War I had just ended. Times were changing rapidly. Um, there was all the sort of in industrialization and new inventions, and women were going to work. And so she was sort of a security blanket and something that the country could hold on to and, you know, work, go forward into this new world. In the 40s, obviously, the whole wartime effort and patriotism and all of that was important. She had another resurgence in the 1960s during the Vietnam War, which I think had to do with the whole sort of love and peace and um, trying to deal with all of that. So I think that, you know, everybody sort of finds something in her that they can make their own that it's a very personal thing. I, I completely agree with you. And when, and the words make their own, mm -hmm. that's, that's I, why I think that um, she's so focus wonderful. Focus on those for a little because, bit, because I don't think that these two are yeah. wonderful and I don't think they've gotten enough uh, attention. I mean, this is a really- so These are, what are these, John? These are just, they're a pair of really wonderful homey dolls um, that someone has made obviously without a pattern, because there was not a pattern that was that large. Um, and, you know, based on probably actually Worth Gruel's artwork as opposed to Johnny Gruel's. But, um, and this is what I think makes the handmade dolls so special. I haven't really focused on those in this talk. Maybe that's another talk. But, you know, what people bring talk. to the handmaids um, can really wonderful. make them wonderful. They really are, and you can tell there's just these were meant to be a pair, but it's mm -hmm. funny. Andy is actually smaller than Anne, mm -hmm. and he and the faces are totally different, and the hands are different. Mm -hmm. What I love about them is that it, even if you didn't have much, mm -hmm. even if all you had was a little bit of yarn, mm -hmm. you could you could make a you could have a raggedy Ann. Oh yeah, and what's interesting is that the um, instructions to make a raggedy Ann appeared in women's magazines in the 1920s. Um, so they would give you sort of the basic idea of how to do it. And the other thing that's neat is sort of like the big pair you just showed, possibly that was a case where there was a older sister and a younger brother. So the dolls were made size-wise accordingly um, to represent the oh, children in the family. 
Right. Oh, that could be too. Mm -hmm. We just don't know the story sometimes on them. And so it's fun to just kind of think about what actually happened and, mm -hmm. and what was there. But I have found, and I know you have found in your um, travels and collecting mm -hmm. so many dolls that are raggedy and I guess we could say tight. Oh, yeah. Where somebody put their own spin on mm -hmm. them. Absolutely. And it's really fun. Yeah. There are some really fascinating ones like that that were done. And during the 30s, when the whole litigation thing was going on, there were a few people who did cottage industry dolls that were, you know, they're not quite commercial, but they're not just homemade either. And some of those are really fun. Oh, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jonathan Green, this has been such a fun and interactive discussion. You and I and so many people watching just love Raggedy Ann and, and or, or they now love her. What are some, um, can you give us a way that our audience can, if they want to know more, learn more? I know you wrote a great article in um, UFDC Doll News. Yes, um, that's a good, good place to start. Um, I mean, the article, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. I have to do the caveat. Um, some parts got edited out, um, but uh, that's a good place to start. Uh, there's a couple of very good books on Johnny Gruel, and I can't think of the um, author's name, but I'm assuming I can probably post a comment at the bottom of this and give you all the information. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and... we, all know who, we all know who the expert is, <laughs> and he is the one giving a presentation at the first ever virtual doll convention. Mm -hmm. So, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, you're, you're phenomenal. So there are some great books, but also you are just a wonderful wealth of knowledge. Can our viewers write to you oh. a question or reach out? I, you can always like email to. me, PM me. Um, I'm okay. very um, easy to talk to, to get you're information great. from. Um, I'd be glad to share. Absolutely. Yes, you're always glad to share. You're Jonathan Green on Facebook, also known as uh, what's your what's your uh, ultimate? Oh, uh, Fritzel Cruz, which is, yeah, it started started out to keep the doll stuff off the family pages, but then it just sort of became uh, the the other love of my life, Katie Cruz. So um, that sort of became the Katie Cruz personality. Um, love it. Yeah. So. Well, that that'll hopefully I think that will probably have to be our next program. So. Okay, sounds good. Uh -oh. Thank you, Jonathan mm -hmm. Green. If you guys have questions, uh, post them in the comments of this video. Jonathan will be responding and posting additional uh, resources for you and information. And he'll be responding to your questions. So you can post pictures on this video. And John will he'll be glad to respond, won't you? Oh, have? absolutely. You know, I would love to have a nice long um, post trail off of this video of questions that uh, everyone has. And another thing that Jonathan and I are going to talk about also in the future is um, preservation and, and cleaning, yes. which uh, applies to a lot of cloth dolls, not just Raggedy Ann, but I think that's a very important subject too. So yeah, um, that, maybe we'll be able to get that, get that one done soon as well. Sure. That sounds great. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jonathan Green. And thank you everyone at Virtual Doll Convention for tuning in and enjoying our program today. Thanks. Bye. Bye.